Romans chapter 1. Again, I hope you've been, hope you've been uh, reading ahead. <clears throat> and we're not going to make it very far today. There's some pretty big stuff that we're going to talk about in the few verses that we are going to look at. We're going to pick up at verse 16 in Romans chapter 1. And so in verses 14 and 15 at the end of the message last week, we looked at verses 14 and 15 and Paul, Paul talked about his obligation to preach the gospel, the good news about Jesus, to everyone. He talked about preaching it to, to those within the Greek culture, those who were outside of the Greek culture. He talked about preaching the gospel to, to those who were wise, those who were foolish. He, he, he talked about preaching it to everybody, and he said, that's, that's why I want to come, and I, 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 I want to preach it there in, in Rome as well. And he had never been able to make it there yet, and he still desired to do that. But now he addresses another aspect of, of his preaching here. As Paul said in 1 Corinthians 1.23, although the crucified Jesus was a stumbling block to Jews, and to Gentiles it was, anybody remember? Foolishness. That despite that fact, he was not, what? Ashamed. Read verse 16 with me. For I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. First to the Jew and then to the Gentile. Paul was not ashamed of the good news about Jesus' sacrifice on the cross because it is the power by which God saves all those who will believe in Jesus, in true saving faith. And that's everybody, whether they are Jew or Gentile. Paul had been imprisoned. Paul had been run out of town. Paul had been beaten. He had been stoned. He had been sneered at. He had been thought to be a fool. But he still remained eager to preach it. As Jesus said, Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness. This is what Jesus said again. Remember, blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. He went on to say, blessed are you when people insult you, when people persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. He said, rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward. When? Where? Where? In heaven. That's Matthew 5, verses 10 through 12. Why then, knowing all this, knowing what Jesus said, why then, when we have the opportunity to speak up, uh, speak up and speak out about Jesus, why then do we so often fail to do it? I think it's because we ultimately know that the gospel message about Jesus is more times than not usually something unsaved people don't want to hear. We're often afraid, we're often even embarrassed of what the reaction would be if we would talk to somebody about Jesus. We know it usually won't be well received. Because at the core of the gospel, at the core of the message about Jesus, the good news, at the core of the good news is the bad news, which is what? That unsaved people, that we, we are sinners, all people are sinners, all people deserve punishment from God, and all people deserve that punishment of God, which is said in the Bible to be what? Eternity in the lake of fire. We know that that is not well received by people when we tell them that. Paul obviously had a different kind of an attitude about preaching the gospel, didn't he? 
than that, than the kind of attitude we often have. Paul obviously had a very different attitude about it, even in the face of the persecution that he went through. And many other followers of Jesus since Paul have had attitudes like Paul, not attitudes like we have often. The original author of the, this following statement is unknown. Supposedly it was written by a, a pastor or a missionary to Africa. And it was written just before he was murdered for preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. Just prior to his murder, he wrote this. I am a part of the fellowship of the unashamed. He said, I have Holy Spirit power. The die has been cast. I have stepped over the line. The decision has been made. I am a disciple of Jesus. I won't look back. I won't let up. I won't slow down. I won't back away. I won't be still. My past is redeemed. My present makes all the, every sense in the world. And my future is secure. I'm finished and done with low living and walking just by sight and small planning and having smooth knees because I don't get on them and pray and colorless dreams and tame visions and mundane talking and chintzy giving and dwarfed goals. He wrote, I no longer need prosperity or position or promotions or plaudits or popularity. I don't have to be right. I don't have to be first. I don't have to be recognized. I don't have to be praised. I don't have to be regarded by others. I don't have to be rewarded. I now live by presence. I learn by faith. I love by patience. I lift by prayer. And I labor by power. My pace is set. My gate is fast. My goal is heaven. My road is narrow. My way is rough. My companions are few. My guide is reliable. And my mission is clear. I cannot be bought. I cannot be compromised. I cannot be deterred. I cannot be lured away. I cannot be turned back. I cannot be deluded. I cannot be delayed. I will not flinch in the face of sacrifice. I will not hesitate in the presence of adversity. I will not negotiate at the table of the enemy. I will not ponder at the pool of popularity. I won't meander in the maze of mediocrity. I will not give up, back up, let up, or shut up until I've preached up, prayed up, paid up, stored up, and stayed up for the cause of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. He closed with this. He said, I am a disciple of Jesus Christ. I must go. I must keep going until He returns. I must give until I drop. I must preach until all know. I must work until He comes. And when He comes, when He comes to get His own, He will have no problem recognizing me. My colors will be clear, for I am not ashamed of the gospel, because it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes. Could that possibly be our pledge? Can we claim that kind of a commitment? That kind of a focus? Could we live in that kind of a way in saying, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ? He died for it. He backed up when he said he was not ashamed of the gospel. How are we doing? How are you doing? As for the phrase in here, first for the Jew, then for the Gentile, you folks that were at Sunday school, you remember I said that that phrase came up in Sunday school in Acts. I said it's going to come up again in the message. It does here in verse 16. First for the Jew, then for the Gentile. We know that God's first chosen people was the nation of Israel. Yes. Which God miraculously formed and made a nation. How did God miraculously form the nation, by the way? 
How did God miraculously form the nation of Israel? How was it miraculous? Okay, because Abraham and Sarah were both past childbearing years, way past, and had been barren, hadn't been able to have children all their lives, and yet God miraculously allowed them to conceive a child, Isaac, who again, then the descendants of, became the people of Israel, the nation of Israel. The Messiah, the Savior, Jesus, was a Jew. His earthly descendancy was of Jewish origin. He was first the promised Messiah of Israel, and then he also became a light for the Gentiles. When Paul traveled to a new city, he would first preach and teach his fellow Jews. And then after he would wear out his welcome with them, he would preach and teach to the Gentiles. I think all of this harkens back to what God said to Abraham. He said, all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. Genesis 12, 3. And as God said in Genesis 18, 18, Abraham will surely become a great and powerful nation. That great and powerful nation would be the nation Israel. And all nations on earth, all nations would be then Gentiles, only, only the nation of Israel are the Jews, and all other nations are the Gentiles, and all nations on earth will be blessed through Him. So the blessings would first come to the Jew, and then through the promised one of the Jews would come the blessings to the Gentiles. The big point out of this verse 16, of course, again, is how committed are we to live for Jesus? And I often in real life Christianity moments and otherwise share stories about what some people have, are still doing today. How they suffer for Jesus. We live in a place where so far we don't have to suffer too much. But what is our level of commitment to Jesus? Is our biggest persecution because we get embarrassed when we talk about Jesus to friends and family and so forth? You want to compare that to the... I think I mentioned somewhere recently the young man in some third world country that... Uh, he was taken captive simply because he was a Christian and ma mashed in the head with a machete and had his private parts whacked off with a machete. And he survived. And he's the happiest guy you can ever come across. He goes around telling people about Jesus. How do we stack up? Can we say we really are unashamed of Jesus? Verse 17. For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed. A righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. That should sound familiar, at least to Dale, what he read before Sunday school. It says the righteousness of God is revealed in the gospel here in verse 17. It's made known, the righteousness of God is made known in the gospel message about Jesus. The righteousness of God cannot otherwise be known. It can't be known by observing the beauty of the creation around us. It can't be known by studying the Mosaic Law. The righteousness of God can only be known by coming to saving faith in Jesus Christ. It is not revealed in any other way. It simply cannot be grasped any other way than what coming to faith in Jesus. A righteousness, it says, that is by faith from first to last. In the NIV translation, that can also be translated from faith for faith, or from faith to faith, or out of faith in reference to faith, regardless of how we translate it. I think the understanding is that the righteousness of God is received by faith, which then results in a life of faith. Faith lived out. 
And that ties directly, the reason I think that's the best explanation for it, it ties directly to the next statement in verse 17 where it says, and it quotes Habakkuk, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. That's Habakkuk 2 and verse 4. Those who truly, truly receive the righteousness of, of God by faith in Jesus, then they truly live by faith in daily life. The person who regularly and purposely does what is right, the person who regularly and purposely does what is right in the eyes of God, then is righteous. Though obviously none of us are perfectly righteous, right? But righteous character received from God by faith then expresses itself in righteous conduct, in, in a righteous way of living. True belief, I'm saying this in a lot of different ways, true belief, understand, many people would call themselves a Christian but do not have true saving faith in Jesus. True faith in Jesus, true saving faith, breeds then godly behavior as the norm in a person's life. We all still screw up. But the norm in a truly saved person is that they live righteously. They live in accordance with the Word of God. And to do that, of course, you need to know the Word of God. A truly saved person will not, again, perfectly obey God, but obedience to God will be the general nature of their life. Now, I want you to listen to this closely. A person who claims salvation, a person who claims that they're going to heaven, or claims, you know, I've gone to church for 45 years, or whatever, they, they, they claim that they are good with God. A person who does that, yet lives in an ongoing, deliberate, sinful lifestyle, is not truly saved. No matter what prayer they think they've prayed, no matter what baptism they got, no matter what altar they've come forward to, if somebody who lives a deliberately, purposely sinful lifestyle and never turns away from that, that demonstrates that they are not saved. And their destiny is the lake of fire for all of eternity. Now if somebody at any given time is living that way, and if they really are truly saved, but just they're in a season of life where they're being disobedient to God, they're living in some kind of sin that is against what God says how we should live, then you know what I can just about guarantee you is going to happen to them then? If they are really truly saved, but they're living a, a, an active lifestyle in sin, God is going to discipline them here on this earth. He is going to bring discipline upon them. If a truly saved person is living in outward, purposeful, deliberate sin, God will deal with them. I trust that you know that I can say that from my understanding of the Word of God, but I will tell you that I know that from personal experience. And that's, of course, a story for another day. The only way a person can practice genuine righteousness is if they possess the nature of the only one who is righteous. And how can we possess the nature of the only one who is righteous? How can we possess His nature? Through saving faith in Him. And then through the power of the Holy Spirit working in us. The indwelling Holy Spirit empowers holy living. And an individual's conduct is a powerful evidence of their true nature. So that if I live a sinful life, now understand, not sinful by your definition, or my definition, sinful by God's definition in the Bible. If we are deliberately doing that, that is a reflection of an unsaved person. A saved person, will, it will be reflected in their life. They will live a generally holy life and they will strive to live a holier and holier life as they go on and as they learn more from the Word of God and as they put that into play in their life, that will happen because they will be enabled to do that because if they have true saving faith in Jesus, they have His Holy Spirit living and working in them, directing them, guiding them, prompting them, prodding them 
and empowering them to live the way God says to live. To have truly a desire to do what is righteous in God's eyes. And to live a righteous, holy life. Many, many times over the years and still these days, I hear people saying sometimes directly to me things like, God knows how I am. You know, He made me how I am. You know, I, I live the way I do, but He accepts me. He accepts me. God never accepts sin. I can guarantee you that. The Bible is very clear about that. God does not accept sin. And we're going to see that here in the next verses. <laughs> if you have true saving faith in Jesus, then God expects you to live the way He calls you to live. Don't make the mistake I made early in life and think that living a holy life was only something preachers or missionaries did. I said those words. I lived that way. I didn't believe that an everyday guy like me was supposed to live like a preacher lives. I was dead wrong. God let me know that in some pretty painful ways in my life back in those days. Don't make the same mistake. Verses 18 through 20. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven. Now, what we talk about was revealed in verse 17. What do we just talk about? God's righteousness. The righteousness of God is revealed, it says in verse 17. And now verse 18 says, The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people. People who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Since what may be known about God is plain to them, because God has made it plain to them. For because since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, His eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made. That's creation all around us. So that people are what? Without excuse. So that people are without excuse. There's some really big stuff here. This is going to be all the rest of the sermon on these verses. Some of the big stuff that's here answers one of the questions that's often asked. How can it be fair that somebody in some, you know, lower Zimbabwe country or some, some jungle somewhere, whatever, that's never heard of Jesus and never saw a Bible, how can it be fair that they... You know, they don't even know, they've never even heard of Jesus or never even saw a Bible. How is it fair that they're condemned? These verses answer that question. And I'm going to try to work through it with you. But first of all, some of you are thinking, what? Here we go again. The wrath of God. God's judgment. Why do we got to do this again? Can somebody answer the first reason why? Because it's in the Bible. Well, more than that. Why, why, why right now, why are we going through this? Why are we talking about the wrath of God and the judgment of God again, right now? Because it's in your study. Because we're studying through the book of Romans. We're studying every verse through the book of Romans. And what are these verses talking about? The wrath of God. The wrath of God and the judgment of God, right? That's number one for those who are saying, oh, why are we doing this again? That, right now, that's why, because that's what verses 18 through 20 are talking about. Right? Let me tell you something else as far as why. The wrath of God and the righteous judgment of God is a huge part of the Bible. <laughs> and so when we preach our way through, we teach our way through, we study our way through any book of the Bible, you're going to see this come up a lot. Why don't people know that? Because they don't read it for themselves and they often sit in a church where it's never preached. Because the whole Bible, the whole Word of God is not being preached and especially maybe because it might offend somebody.
The wrath of God and the righteous judgment of God is a huge thing. It is what believers are saved from. The wrath of God and the righteous judgment of God is what unbelievers will face forever, for e eternity. The wrath of God, the righteous judgment of God is why God Himself forever took on a human body and died that horrible death on the cross and rose from the dead in triumph over Satan, sin, and death. Why is there a good news about Jesus? Why is there a good news about Jesus? Why did there need to be a good news about Jesus? Because, of the bad news. because there is bad news about you and me. And every person that will ever live and has ever lived. The bad news is every person disobeys God and not one of us will seek after God on our own. We deserve God's punishment. That is the bad news. That is the reason that there needed to be a good news through, that could only be provided through God Himself when He forever allowed Himself to be changed and took on a human body and paid the price on the cross. There is a good news to talk about. And it is dang good news, right? And I love talking about it. But the whole reason there is a good news is because of the bad news. The wrath and the judgment of God deserved wrath and judgment of God. And if you're still like, oh, I just don't want to hear this about this stuff, you know, well, I hate to break something to you. And if you haven't read in head in Romans, you're going to really be disappointed because starting here in chapter 18 or verse 18 in chapter 1 and clear through chapter 3 in verse 20, Paul delivers, the Holy Spirit led Paul to deliver an indictment against human beings. Clearly demonstrating why people need the righteousness of God that is revealed to them only through saving faith in Jesus. That's what, that's what all this is going to be about, clear through chapter 3 and verse 20. Answering the question, well, why, you know, why the blood, you know, why, why, why the sacrifice? If, if, why could God just save us all? So, no, we deserve wrath. We deserve judgment. Paul delivers that indictment here through verse 20 in chapter 3 in the book of Romans. We cannot understand our need for righteousness. Listen to me. We cannot understand how badly we need the righteousness of God until what? We understand the depth of the ugliness of our sin against God. We cannot understand the infinite blessing of salvation. Hear me now. We can't really understand how wonderful the infinite blessing of being saved is until we understand the infinite horror of what we need to be saved from, which is what? Punishment in the lake of fire forever. And we can't understand until we understand why we need saved from it, which is our total and complete unrighteousness. We are not basically good people. No person is basically good at heart. The Bible says clearly we are all evil at heart. Wicked at heart. And the lack of understanding that is a big problem in the church today. God's wrath is His righteous indignation against everything that is unrighteous. Against everything that is unholy. Now it's not, it is not a wrath of uncontrollable rage and vindictive bitterness or, or him losing his temper. No, God's wrath is not like our wrath. God's wrath is not like human wrath. Our wrath is tainted and driven by what? Sin, sin. sin and God is perfectly holy. He has no sin. God's wrath flows actually from His sinless nature. God's wrath is actually fully righteous. God's wrath is completely just. God's wrath is perfectly holy. And just as verse 17 said that the righteousness of God is revealed in the good news about Jesus, so here in verse 18 it says that the wrath of God 
is being revealed from heaven. It's being revealed in, 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 as God's constant, insistent, expressed displeasure and disgust with sin, with human sin. Sin is an insult. Sin is an offense against the holiness of God. And it justifiably incurs His wrath. The Bible clearly teaches that God is merciful and loving. Amen? Amen. Absolutely. The Bible clearly teaches that, but you know what? It just as clearly teaches about the, the just and righteous wrath of God. Neither one of those attributes cancels out the other. Because God is so merciful and loving does not mean that He ignores sin. Or He just says, well, it's okay. He is still also perfectly just and exercises righteous wrath against sin. God is not lenient towards sin. God does not just ignore sin. God's wrath must be poured out upon unforgiven sinners. But God has also personally taken on a human body and bore His own wrath as a substitute for those who would believe in Jesus in true saving faith. Many, many good Bible preaching theologians and scholars and preachers and so forth cite the tragic failure of pastors in general to preach and teach the wrath of God in a lot of churches today. Pastor Ray Pritchard gave this quote in one of his sermons. Quoting Ray, Pastor Pritchard, The thought that nice people we know might someday go to eternal hell is so overwhelming... So disheartening that we'd much rather not think about it at all. It's the word wrath that grabs our attention. We're accustomed to hearing about the love of God. We know about the grace of God. We sing about the mercy of God. We extol the glory of God. We ponder the holiness of God. But the wrath of God? We hardly ever mention that. There aren't many hymns written about God's wrath. We'd much rather sing, Jesus loves me. This I know. Right? But you cannot read Romans chapter 1 without coming face to face with the wrath of God. And quote from Pastor Pritchard. So how is the wrath of God being revealed from heaven? Well, the Precept Austin website, which is a, a huge Bible commentary site, it says this, quote, God's wrath is always being revealed from heaven against those who mock His name and reject His truth. This revelation of His wrath began in the Garden of Eden when He passed the death sentence upon Adam and Eve and upon all of their descendants as well. The wrath of God was later revealed in the worldwide flood that drowned all of mankind except for eight souls whom God saved. It was revealed later in the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. It was revealed after that in the drowning of Pharaoh's army. But what's the greatest, the greatest revelation of the wrath of God was when? What was the greatest revelation of the wrath of God? Jesus' death. Whenever the wrath of God was poured out upon Jesus Christ as He hung on the cross, God the Son hanging on the cross with the wrath of God poured out upon Him when He cried out, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It was the greatest expression, revelation of the wrath of God in all of history. <coughs> Still quoting Precept Austin website, the revelation of God's wrath will culminate, it will climax in two great expressions of His wrath. The first one at the end of this present age, during the time referred to as Daniel's 70th week, which we would often refer to as the, the tribulation, the tribulation period. And you can see six uses of the word wrath. That's the Greek word orge. 
Six uses of that in the book of Revelation, chapter 6, 11, 14, 16, and 19. Six different references to the wrath of God during this end time, the time of the tribulation period. And the tribulation period will culminate with what? With the coming of Jesus Christ back to the earth. The second coming of Jesus. At which time then Revelation 19.15 says this of the returning Jesus, coming out of His mouth as a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron scepter. He treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God. This is how Jesus will return to the earth. This meek and mild Jesus you have been fooled into believing in. In many cases. He will return and exercise the fury of the wrath of God. At this time, He will defeat the Antichrist. He will tear down all His enemies. He will slay. He will kill any unbeliever that has survived the tribulation period up to that point. Jesus will strike them dead and send their souls to Hades to wait until the time of the great white throne judgment when they will be raised from the dead in a very real body that will last forever, but they will face His judgment. And then they will be cast forever where? Into the lake of fire. After He does all that stuff as far as defeating the Antichrist and taking out all the unbelievers left on the earth after the tribulation period. He'll set up His thousand year reign here on earth as He will reign as King over the nation Israel and He will reign as dominant over all the nations of the earth and He will rule them with an iron scepter. Following that thousand years, I'm still quoting from Precept Austin, following that thousand years there will be the final revelation then of God's wrath, which Peter describes as a day that the heavens will disappear with a roar, the elements will be destroyed by fire, and the earth and everything done in it will be laid bare, 2 Peter 3.10. And that's the end of the quote from Precept Austin website. That will be the final devastation of all that is mortal. And the great white throne judgment will come after that. And then God will create the new heavens and the new earth upon which all the believers of all the ages will live with God. And He will be their God and they will be His people. And they will live in a paradise for the rest of all of eternity. John MacArthur explains how God's wrath is being revealed in, from heaven in this way. He wrote, quote, Heaven reveals God's wrath in two ways, through His moral order and through His personal intervention. When God made the world, He built in certain moral as well as physical laws that ever since have governed how this world operates. Just as a person falls to the ground and suffers the consequences when they jump from a high building... There are certain rules of the creation, gravity being one of them, physical damages that happen when your body has forces like that exerted against it. If you jump off a high building, you are going to land on the ground and you are going to suffer the, suffer the consequences from it, right? That's, that's built in. God doesn't have to make that happen. It's part of God's laws built into what He has created here. So too, MacArthur says... Does a person fall into God's judgment when he deviates from God's moral law? That is built-in wrath. When a person sins, there is a built-in consequence that inexorably works. In this sense, God is not specifically intervening, but He's letting the laws of moral cause and effect work. And what I, what I will add to that in the midst of MacArthur's comments here, I will add, I, what I would define that as being is that God, God can work out His purposes in just letting things happen in the way that He has them set up. There are certain things, there are certain moral laws that if you disobey them, you're going to suffer consequences for them. If you drink too much for too long, your health is going to suffer, right? God doesn't have to do anything. The, it's, it's the way He has His wrath built into creation. He says we should not be drunken. Those who do that, especially as a lifestyle, will pay consequences for it, and God doesn't have to do anything. Their health will deteriorate. They will have family problems, etc., etc. That's just one example. 
There, there are infinitely number of more examples I could give. That's what MacArthur's saying. That's part of how God's wrath continues to be revealed because He has things set up to wake creation as it operates and the laws of creation, the way God designed them, that kind of stuff happens. That wrath of God comes upon people simply in the way things work, just as simply as what happens when you jump off the roof of a tall building and what happens to your body. There are things morally that the same, same thing happens. And then MacArthur says the second way in which God reveals His wrath is, is through His direct and personal intervention. He is not just some impersonal cosmic force that like wound up the clock of creation and then let it, lets it run and just sits back and isn't involved in it. That's, that is not the God of the Bible. God's wrath is executed exactly according to His divine will. And I believe when God directly does get in, involved in revealing His wrath in this day and age in which we've lived, in which the world has operated, all those examples cited by the Precept Austin commentary, all the, the flood, you know, the, the uh, destruction of Pharaoh's army, the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, all those examples given by, in the Precept Austin commentary, those are examples of where God stepped in and His wrath was demonstrated. That ends uh, the quoting stuff from MacArthur's commentary. I'll say, God's wrath is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people, against a lack of reverence for God, against a denial that God even exists, against rebellion against God, against disrespect for the authority of God, against injustice against God, and generally speaking, the wrath of God is revealed against people loving sin instead of loving God and His truth. And we cannot get around that. And that would include those of us maybe that are, that are doing pretty well in our life. There, as far as spiritually, there are many times when we actually love our sin. We love still to do things that we know are sin. And I could talk about that a lot more. But I won't. All of these offenses of, against God then actually lead us to commit offenses against fellow human beings who, of course, like us, are made in the image of God. Sinful and wicked people, it says here in these verses I read, suppress the truth. And this is where we're getting now. If, I, if I'm losing you, please come back here because this is going to help answer some of the, that, that question I said about. What about the people in lower Zimbabwe that never heard of Jesus and never saw a Bible? Listen to me now. Sinful and wicked people suppress the truth of what may be easily known of God because God has made it plain to them. It said in these verses we read, God has made it plain to them what can be known about Him in His what? In His creation. God has made it plain to anyone, everyone, every person. He has made it plain to them. His power and His other attributes. Later we will see that God has also built a sense of His law actually into the consciences of human beings. We'll see that when we get to Romans chapter 2. That all human beings actually have a form of God's law programmed into us to a degree. Stay tuned for Romans chapter 2 about that. But here in these verses, the primary focus is on suppressing God's truth relative to His, His creation all around us. But even that does tie into the internal testimony that God has given us as well. All people, regardless of their relative opportunities to know God's Word, to hear the Gospel about Jesus, all people, regardless of whether they've had a chance to hear that or not, have both internal and external God-given evidences of His existence and His nature. But human, human beings are universally inclined to resist, ignore, and even attack that evidence. 
the internal testimony from God. Again, Romans chapter 2, we'll see about it. And the external evidences of God in creation. Uh, see Psalm 19. I'm going to actually quote Psalm 19, 1 through 4 here shortly. Both of the, the internal and external, all that stuff is enough to lead every human being to seek out God. To seek out the one who did the creating. To seek out the one who put within us some of these, some of the, this in our consciences, some of the law of God. It's enough to lead every human being to know that they need to seek out this God and find out who this God is. But yet, as we will see when we get to Romans chapter 3 and verse 11, how many people seek God on their own? None. 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 It says no one seeks God. On their own, no human being will seek God. Despite the internal evidences in their consciences that God built into us, and despite the, the creation of God, that it gives unmistakable testimony of, that there had to be that one who created it, people will still not seek out that God. None of us. Thus, a person's refusal to respond to that evidence is enough in and of itself. Listen to me. Just the fact that somebody in Lower Zimbabwe sees these things and has something built into them that tells them about the law of God, internal and external evidences of God, and yet they still will not seek Him out, and that in and of itself is enough to condemn them. That in and of itself is enough to condemn them, God says. Causes them to be condemned for what, though? They are condemned, but what is the cause of their condemnation still? Sin. Their sins. They sin against God. And there's a way out of it. But they need to seek out the God who made the creation around them, the God who put some of the laws, His laws in their consciences and so forth, but they reject all that and they refuse to seek God and therefore they are condemned for the penalty of their sins. And they will be subject to God's wrath. This internal testimony that I've talked about, internal testimony from God and external evidences of God in creation, that is called general revelation. The general revelation of God. That's what we call it in theological terms. Psalm 19, 1 through the first part of verse 4. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of His hands. Day after day they pour forth speech. What pours forth speech? All the creation of God pours forth speech. Night after night they reveal knowledge. They have no speech. They use no words. No sound is heard from them, yet their voice goes out into all the earth. That's what Psalm 19, the opening of Psalm 19 is about. That it is shouting out from God. His creation is shouting out, I am here. Just like the who's and the... the who, who's, Horton, here's a who. We are here. We are here. We are here. Yeah. Some of you have watched it, hopefully. Anyway, that's God. God's creation shouts out, He is here. He is here. He is here. But people re reject it. Ignore it. Actually argue against it. A young student from Nigeria named John was asked how he became a Christian. John answered, When I was a little boy running around the bo in the bush country of Nigeria, I knew there was a God. I would stand among the trees and look up at the skies at night and I knew that someone made this world and this universe. He said, I knew there was a God, but I didn't know who He was. I didn't know what to call Him. One day, Josephine Skaggs, a Southern Baptist missionary, came to our village to teach us children how to read. She taught us how to read the Bible. And there I discovered the name of the God who had revealed Himself to me through the trees and the stars. This is the answer, folks, again, to the question, what about, how is it fair, what about these people that have never heard of Jesus and have never even seen a Bible? The answer is, is that there is internal evidences given to them. There is external evidences given to them of a God that has to be there. A God who had to create all this and put that stuff inside their consciences and yet they reject it. 
in their nature, in, in their own doing, they will reject it. And they have no excuse. There is then, therefore, no excuse. And that's what verse 20 ends up saying. God's eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that people are without, without excuse. That is the answer to that question I've heard a zillion times. And I'll probably hear a zillion more times if I live long enough. We can know that God exists through this general revelation. That knowledge is enough to condemn us, for we are left with no excuse not to seek God. However, to know God in saving faith requires special revelation. What is God's special revelation? How do we receive God's special revelation? We receive a special revelation through God's written Word, His perfect, eternal, written Word, which is the Bible, and we receive it through the living Word, which is Jesus. God the Son, Jesus Christ. That is special revelation. We cannot be saved through general revelation from God. It gives us ample evidence of God's existence, and it should cause us to seek out the God who created, but we may only be saved through special revelation of the good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ. But since general revelation is enough to condemn us, if someone never hears the special revelation, they're still without excuse because of general revelation. You follow? You tracking? You, you, know, you may not like it, but dispute with me with what the Word of God says. And it's saying that every one of us, if none of us ever heard the good news about Jesus, we would still be justifiably condemned by God of our sins. First of all, we're all sinful, so we deserve condemnation for that. And secondly, He has given us revelation of Himself, but none of us will actually seek Him out because of it. And therefore, we all deserve hell. And by His grace and mercy, some of us, He makes a point to use special revelation to bring us to faith in Him. My friend, let me tell you, that is why we need to be so grateful. If you have saving faith in Jesus, you should be thanking God every day of your life. Amen. Because it is not of anything you have done. It is because He chose you like we talked about last week in the first sermon here in the book of Romans, and like we're going to really see a lot of when we get to Romans chapters 9, 10, and 11. Again, a doctrine that many people in many churches don't like. I'll stack up with you why, how I understand it from actually preaching out of God's Word. And that's how we should discuss that issue. Lastly, a man wearing jeans, a t-shirt, and a baseball cap positioned himself against a wall beside a trash can at the L'Enfant Plaza station of the Metro in Washington, D.C. He pulled out a violin and he started to play. In the next 43 minutes, he performed six classical pe uh, pieces. Somebody was counting, apparently. 1,097 people passed by and ignored him. Just walked by and just kept walking. No one knew it. But the man playing outside the Metro that day was Joshua Bell, one of the finest classical musicians in the world. And that violin he was playing, if you've ever heard of Stradivarius violin, extremely rare. It was worth three and a half million dollars. One of the best violin players in the planet playing a three and a half million dollar Stradivarius violin and everybody just walked on by. No crowd gathered. He said, quote, it was a strange feeling that people were actually ignoring me. God knows what it feels like to be ignored. The Apostle Paul said that God has sovereignly planted evidence of His existence in the very soul of mankind. And creation delivers this unmistakable message about God's creativity and His beauty and His power and His character. And although God has revealed His majesty, many refuse to acknowledge it and thank Him. But God will hold everyone responsible for ignoring who He is and what He has revealed. Quote, they are without excuse because although they knew God, they did not glorify Him as God, nor were thankful. Romans 1, verses 20 and 21. 
And all this, this story about the violin player and all I'm reading right now is quoted out of an Our Daily Bread devotional. He closes it up. He says, Let us acknowledge and thank the virtuoso of heaven who has wonderfully revealed himself to us. And he quotes a poem by somebody named Bosch. The treasures of the crystal snows and all the wonders nature shows speak of a mighty maker's hand that all in love and wisdom planned. And he says, All creation is an outstretched finger pointing to God. That was written by Marvin Williams in Our Daily Bread. And all of this is why people are without excuse. Even if they've never heard about Jesus or saw, the, saw a Bible. For the beauty of the earth, for the glory of the skies, for the love which from our birth over and around us lies, for the wonder of each hour of the day and of the night, hill and vale, tree and flower, sun and moon, and stars of light, Lord of all, to Thee we raise this, our hymn of grateful praise. That's the closing hymn for the beauty of the earth, 182. Please turn there as we sing. 182.